Well, here's a story from about the year 2000, when the blues world was changing and uh, what was a blues gig started to become different from what traditionally was, which would be uh, small bars or uh, concerts or clubs uh, or festivals. There began to be blues bands in other places. Uh, this almost reminds me of uh, Selwyn Birchwood's Chuck E. Cheese camping story. Right. But uh, <laughs> I played at a winery with one of Muddy's sons, Big Bill Morganfield, and my band. And we had a long time to play. There were a, a couple of 90 minute sets and we, we would do about half of it with Bill leading the band and about half of it with me leading the band. And uh, I decided, uh, well, this is a good opportunity. Uh, people are, there's a very general audience. There's little kids out there. There's people that are hanging out at the winery and uh, maybe sampling what they sell there, uh, families, uh just uh young uh 20 so something people just partying together and uh, it was a bright sunny day and we were out in the sunshine which is not a traditional blues background is it no. uh <laughs> so as i'm i decided to go back and play some of the old songs because i felt like it and I played Muddy Waters' song, Can't Be Satisfied, which uh, is a very catchy sounding song. And really, uh, he said, that's the song that put me on the road uh, because it first started to get him some recognition. Muddy said he could uh, hear, he could drive by a, a bar and hear it coming out of the jukebox. Uh, he could drive by, drive through Chicago and hear the song coming out of people's open windows. It really made him feel good. And that meant more to me, than, well, even than the music did, that he loved that song so much and he told me about it. Uh, he did kind of teach me how to play it. Well, I stayed at his house right after I joined his band and... Uh, I would take out an unplugged guitar and go in a far corner of the house and start to mess with, uh, say, some of his songs. And I would play Can't Be Satisfied in a corner of the living room when he was in the kitchen, and I would hear this huge wrong come, and he would come, come over and tell me I wasn't doing it right. And I said, well, here's the guitar why don't you show me how to do it right? And he wouldn't do that. He said he was too old to teach. Well, frankly, he said something bad about my mother. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but he would like talk the ch what he wanted me to do different to me. For instance, yeah. as a guitar player, you'll appreciate this. He told me you have to get in and out of your notes faster, make them snappier. And the way he chose to do it for that kind of song was to clamp uh, the heel of his picking hand down on the bridge and cut the note off and shape the note that way. And I wasn't doing that as uh, precisely for the sound and rhythm he wanted to hear. And I got a giant lesson just then. And what I just said might make somebody a better guitar player right now. Right. But, um, I was thinking of what the song meant to him, and I was thinking of the words to the song, some of which are incredibly politically incorrect, <laughs> and uh, are, the rest of them come from other songs with verses just put together. Right. A and there's not a lot of meaning to it, but boy, does that song feel bluesy when you hear Muddy Waters to Can't Be Satisfied. Yeah. And 
course, nobody can sing it like him. Some of, some of his sons come close because it's in the shape of their face to make that voice. Yeah. Uh, and on the inside, too. But uh, I, I was singing Can't Be Satisfied, and I was thinking of some of the verses that were kind of hard-edged and I was behind my shades, and I realized that I'll bet Muddy Waters never sang that song, especially at the time that he wrote it and conceived it in a place like this, in the sunshine at a winery with people frolicking around and uh, just having a good time, but it was definitely not what the traditional blues audience was at the time. And uh, I uh, I played the song and I closed my eyes when I did the guitar solo and just went, went to Muddy's world for a minute. And when I opened my eyes, six feet in front of me, there was a child chasing a butterfly. And I, I said, no, I know Muddy never saw that. Yeah. So th this is uh, 17 years or so after Muddy passed, but the blues world had changed some, and now, for a long time now, it's been on cruise ships, it's in casinos, uh, it is in, well, venues like uh, Florida restaurants. Right. And uh, it's nice that it's getting around, but sometimes... It's a little strange. Uh, let me just add one more thing about that particular day in, in 2000. The, uh, the winery was in Idaho, near Boise, which not a place I had gone very much, uh, even with Muddy when we traveled all over. But um, a friend of mine uh, who was a very good guitar player named Scott Cable was working... Uh, traveling around the country, uh, helping hospitals be more efficient. He had a really right. good job doing that, but he would get into the music scene every once in a while, Scott Cable. And he um, brought down a young man that he had met in Boise who uh, he said, this guy's really a great harmonica player and singer. We should have invited him up, but we didn't. But we hung out with him all day. His name was uh, John Namath. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm Damon, and this is Gig Stories from Fowler's Garage. If you like the content, please hit the subscribe button, give us a like, and a share.